the matter of faith alone isn't just an academic question. It's also a pastoral issue. It has to do with our relationship uh, with God. We're, we're not interested in just academically disputing and debating these matters. Uh, that's, that's not helpful when we're thinking about our relationship with God. So that pastoral sense is caught by Francis Turretin. He says, but when we rise to the heavenly tribunal and place before our eyes that supreme judge, then in an instant the vain confidence of men perishes and falls and conscience is compelled to confess that it has nothing upon which it can rely before God. We talk about faith alone, which the Latin is sola fide, because we confess and affirm that salvation comes by God's grace alone and not our efforts. That's what we mean by faith alone. Salvation comes by God's grace alone. Uh, faith alone is something to, to guard and to cherish. We're, we're to guard it, but we're also to cherish the truth. You know, it's important to realize we're not, we're not just guarding and protecting and defending the truth. We are doing that, but we're also cherishing in it, it because if we're not um, cherishing it, it can lead to Phariseeism. I, I like what the hymn says, nothing in my hand I bring, only to your cross I cling. So faith alone gives all the glory to God for our salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, we don't have anything except what we've received from God. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, we read that we're only to boast in the Lord. Is faith alone the gospel? I, I wouldn't say it's the gospel, but I'd say it's an entailment of the gospel. We also realize that faith alone is a slogan. And, and slogans can be helpful, but we also have to be careful because slogans are often misunderstood. Sometimes we think we're understanding what we're saying with a slogan, but we, we really aren't understanding one another. So sometimes we disagree with one another over slogans, but before we say that we're truly disagreeing, we have to work at, at understanding each other. You know, we, we, we can argue on the basis of slogans and not really be understanding what the other is saying. In these lectures, we're on a tour. Uh, we're visiting church history, we're visiting scriptures, we're visiting the theology. And like any tour you're on, we can't visit every place we'd like to visit, but we begin our tour with the early church, with the earliest writers at the time of the New Testament. We affirm that these early church writers affirm the same faith we do. They are our brothers and our sisters in the faith. Uh, we, we have the advantage 2,000 years later, after 2,000 year, years of church history, of, of wrestling with these issues uh, with the perspective of church history. Uh, so we stand on their shoulders so we affirm today the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedon Creed. Uh, we, we aren't the first Christians. It, it isn't just us and the Bible. Uh, I think that's a distortion of the Protestant view. As Protestants, we too are part of the great tradition. We, we too are indebted to those who went before us. Uh, we, we don't believe that the first Christians appeared in the 16th century when the Reformation happened. So we stand in the deepest appreciation with great gratefulness of believers who followed the Lord before us. We, we gratefully acknowledge their faith, their wisdom, their courage, and their devotion. Martin Luther himself acknowledged that there was much good in the church in the 1500 years preceding the Reformation. Uh, when I say this, I don't mean that there weren't weaknesses in the church. Surely there were. Nor should we assume that the church and its doctrines has always been biblical and healthy. You know, the Reformation happened for a reason. There was a need for a Reformation. But the question we're asking is, did the early, earliest writers, the earliest fathers of the church, did they affirm uh, faith alone? 
what was the Reformation emphasis and overreaction. Some scholars argue that the early fathers, those early writers, didn't understand uh, Paul's gospel. They, they argue, Thomas Torrance argues this, that they actually distorted Paul's gospel. Other scholars say that this uh, judgment isn't correct, that the earliest fathers rightly understood and affirmed Paul's theology and the gospel. We have to say those earliest fathers didn't have the same clarity on the issue because the matter wasn't debated in their day. In their day. When, there's a, when there's a debate, we receive uh, greater, greater clarity. So they, they affirmed that we're saved by faith. They also affirmed the necessity of good works. And I think that's a fair summary of what the Bible says. Uh, sometimes they use the word merit. But the word merit may just mean a reward w without the idea of earning salvation. They also opposed what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. I, again, I just want to say the matter of grace and works wasn't really debated until the days of Augustine and Pelagius in the late 4th and early 5th century. So we need to consider and include, of course, Augustine's contribution and recognize at the same time that the discussion has moved since uh, Augustine. We're in a new situation now.